and we're live to uh, review not this and not this but this the Turing test part of the Liberator Chronicles and so uh, Jeff listened to this yesterday uh, okay what we'll do is we'll show you like an outline of the plot yeah I think what we'll do is I'll, we'll show the folks uh, and then we'll ask Jeff what he thinks of it. Right. It's black. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's the darkness of space. It's black. Now, is it because I've got my acceleration on? Let's have a look. Oh. Oh, there we go. That's the notes, but let's go with this one. So I'll I will go in a touch, see if his uh, Jeffness can read that to himself. It it is rather spoilery. You're sort of like giving away like the first ten minutes, like. So yeah, Jeff, what did you think of the uh, the episode? Um, it was all right. Uh, it felt kind of familiar. I mean, like like the plot, you know, kind of had that it's been done before feeling to it. Hmm. But I, I mean, I don't necessarily know a specific thing that that was the same plot exactly. But it just kind of felt like something that had been done, mm. you know. And, and it's just a certain amount of generic sci-fi stuff, I guess, kind of feel to it. But um, the pros of it are, you know, the the actors, you know, the good voices, yeah, um, sound effects and things like that that enhance it, you know, from just being. A straight audiobook in terms of you know the narration um you don't um i mean at least i didn't feel like uh that you know when there's only like two voices that there was anything missing you know it still feels like a complete story i guess part of that is because i've listened to um the companion chronicles doctor who stories yeah. which are pretty much the same format you know they have somebody telling the story and then they usually only have like one other voice that you hear. Uh, so I'm used to that format and it's, and it works, you know? So, um, so simultaneously it seemed like it was a little bit long, but then it didn't seem like a whole lot happened either. So mm. <laughs> that was, I, I found myself feeling like the last, you know, 10, 15 minutes or so, like this should have been like, like, you know, done in two episodes or something, you know? It's uh, one long block, but uh, um, but I have to ask what above Blake Seven. It looks like it says, yeah. I guess the weird letters. Yeah. Because I was like, who is Nieri? I know that's weird. Hans. <laughs> that is just a weird T. Yeah, that does not look like a T at all. <laughs> it looks like an yeah. N yeah. with an I, or it looks like an I dotted with an N. That's what yeah. it looks like. Oh, a Terry Nation gets an apostrophe, but not Blake Seven. So I think I once said that the budget on Blake Seven was so small that they couldn't even afford an apostrophe. <laughs> but, but the well, actual. You know, it's. Yeah. It's all one word too. There's no space, so it's just Blake Seven. But the the actual copyright though does have uh, an apostrophe, and so I'm wondering if Terry Nation did that for copyright reasons. So like the BBC would have the in the misspelt version, because obviously you know they know how to use an apostrophe. 
Terry Nation knew how to use an apostrophe. So there's all sorts of. See, look at it this way, Ben. That that uh, sort of federation symbol thingy. Yeah. Uh, that's behind it. The entire thing is an apostrophe. It, do you know what they did that actually <laughs> like made it genius? Was uh, they they redid it. Uh, and I'll draw it on here, what they did. I will draw what they did. And it was, and I'll try and draw it as best I can. But they actually did something that was genius. And I actually forgot about it. And then I came up with it as an idea, having forgot I'd seen it. And I thought, I'll send this into them. And then I realized I'd already done it. But what they did was they wrote, uh, wait, let me get rid of all that. And I'll write it big. They did it like this. Uh, Blakes like that. Yeah, <laughs> that is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> I love that because that's like the answer. It's back, Blake Seven, and it still hasn't got an apostrophe. <laughs> you could like do it like that. There you go. Uh, a few years ago, I don't know whether they did it to sort of like frighten the oldsters and like to make them lower their fears, but they sort of like did a, a redo of Blake 7 with a new cast. And they actually got a, a good uh, British black actor in called uh, Colin Salmon, who has a great voice. And they had him play uh, Avon, and he was like pretty good as Avon. Yeah, uh, when you're talking about that. Is that was that a TV show, or are you talking about just an audio? Oh, Big Finish! Big Finish actually did like okay. something like a Revolution Reborn or something. Yeah, because when I was looking through the episodes, I, I saw I mean some of those that you know didn't have like they had a series that was about Jenna, but it didn't have the uh, original actress about yeah. Jenna in it. Yeah, Sally the Vet. Um, some of these names will probably uh, ring a bell. Because they've probably also written some Doctor Who stories. And I think I remember them being involved in Doctor Who. Well, I mean, the writer of this episode, I, I know the name. He's written and I think directed to Big Finish Doctor Who stuff, Simon Garrier. Yeah, I think, I think he did a good job on this. Uh, so, for, so, for instance, these people here. Like, we've got, like... Yeah, I've heard Justin of Lisa Richards. Bowerman before. Yeah. And Justin Richards, yeah. Nicholas Briggs. Like, like, I think Justin Richards was, like, involved with Doctor Who magazine and... Yeah, for, uh... For anybody listening who, uh, who does watch the new Doctor Who, Nicholas Briggs, they pretty much use as their voice for all of the like iconic Doctor Who monsters so he plays the Daleks and the Cybermen and <laughs> you know anytime they need somebody to, to do like to sound like a classic Doctor Who monster the Nicholas Briggs is in there and he does the voice of the new Orac oh okay although I could do it at half price <laughs> <laughs> yeah you could um <laughs> yes i would be quite good um Right, uh, what have we got here? So we've done that. Oh, and of course, serious thing. Uh, oh, won't it? It might be Alistair Locke, actually, who does ORAC. Rather than Nicholas Briggs. I'll just have a look. I think it's Alistair Locke. Yes, I do. I do think it's Alistair Locke. Here we go. Yes, Zen, ORAC, Alistair Locke. Well, we didn't have them in this, though, right? No. No, no. Okay. No, because it was like... Uh, basically, what they did is, is, as you know, these ones are cheaper to do than the full cast. Because you don't have to pay them all. Right. And, and of course, Paul Darrow, he's thinking loads of money. <laughs> but but by, by his standards. Uh so uh, I'll just show the uh, inside. These are quite interesting by the uh, by the writer. Uh, I'll uh, I'll zoom in. Uh, you have a look at those. I'll 
just uh, go back. I like this bit here. Um, in a definitive proof of intelligence, in the classic work on the subject, short circuit. <laughs> yeah. Classic movie from my childhood. Yeah. yeah, I didn't watch it until later. Which, you know, it shows how much things have changed in terms of uh, the credit that voice actors get in that at the time... Uh, the voice of number five was uncredited. Wow! Is people didn't uh, people didn't seem to care who the voices of things were. <laughs> Except it was considered they... a different uh, a different category than how, actors, the regular how... live action actors in a film. However, oh yeah, in live action, yes, because we're saying in Transformers the movie, they did well, like, yeah. big up the names, right? cartoons were a little different in fact they went the opposite direction in a way and that's something my younger brother and i have talked about and he's lamented some is that some with some movies they would just try to get big name actors whether or not they were right for the parts at all and and kind of push the regular voice actors to the side transformers is an example of one that made a good balance and that they found they focused on getting people. I mean, they did try to get big name actors, but they got people that had good voices. Yeah, uh, and could and were good for those parts. Yeah, like like the one that played Hot Rod, Rodimus Prime. He had that right balance. Yeah, it was Judd Nelson and and uh, you know Leonard Nimoy, of course, with yeah, Galvatron. Was good. It was and, good as Galvatron. Uh, um, Robert Stack as Ultra Magnus. Yes. And of course, Orson Welles in his yes. uh, definitive role as Unicron. And his final role. <laughs> his final role, yes. Yeah, that, that one, uh, when he said, artif I don't know if a clone is an artificial intelligence. Well, what I, what I thought about that was, because they didn't say in that, like, in, you know, this says something about something being done back in 1950 or something like that. What was the conclusion? Could they tell apart a computer and a person? Oh, no. No, he was saying that that would be any future test of... He was just saying that going forward... Uh, so it, he never actually did it? No, no. And even now, it's... I mean, like, you have them now where you have these robots add blokes on the internet. You know, and they're actually robo-cam girl type things. <laughs> the, so, I remember... Some story, and I didn't read the details, I don't remember, but it was something about how Microsoft had created some kind of AI thing online that was supposed to, like, use social media and have people interact with it, and it would, like, learn from people. And they said that, like, within a s certain number of hours or a day or whatever, that through interaction with people basically messing with this thing, that they had turned the Microsoft uh, AI into, like, a racist and... <laughs> like it, it was, it had become this violent thing, some horrible. I don't even know all the details, but it just was like, yeah, okay, that about, sounds about right. Yeah, but that that also like sounds like the sort of thing that in the NTP would write. Yeah, because I mean, I've talked to Voitech about it was an INTP, and uh, anyway, I won't talk about that. In <laughs> private. Um, uh, so have you read all of this? Yeah. Right, then we're on the next bit. And then this bit is where it gets better because it's like, let more about the character.
Yeah, well, Avon has an affinity for computers, but he also sort of has a rivalry with them, too. Yeah. He, uh, he doesn't, you know, like it when somebody gives the computer too much uh, credit or authority. And also, it's like, with the key to Aurak, it's like, sometimes I don't know whether he's off. Like, sometimes he puts the key in, and then he said, uh, Aurak, were you listening to that? And then he, like, gives it, so it's obvious, like, he wasn't off. And yet other times, they describe it as that's the on-off key. Yeah, I kind of viewed it as it being sort of like some sort of sleep mode or like energy saving mode where he's not fully operational but still has the ability to do some things. Yeah. So it's like running in the background, you know. Uh -huh. But yeah. Wouldn't you like to have that with certain people? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was just thinking um yesterday as I was watching a um, tennis match from 29 years ago. Because uh, it was recorded off the French ESPN, I guess. Yeah. But, of course, the original broadcast, it was at the U.S. Open, so the original broadcast was the American commentators. And you can still hear them on the broadcast, but there's this loud, babbling French guy that talks over them. And, I, you know, I was thinking, yeah, it would be great if I could mute that guy. <laughs> I was sort of like thinking about people in your real life that you could mute. Well, yeah, that too. But I was just thinking of a the most recent example of something that I was thinking, you know, I'd like to, because that's the thing with sports in general is like, I like the sounds of sports, you know, the sound of the of balls hitting bats and rackets yeah. and things like that and crowd noise and stuff. Um, but sometimes the commentators are really irritating. Mm. So now on video games like MLB the show, you can actually turn off the commentary. In fact, you, they do it by individuals. You, there's codes to, to mute individual commentators. So if you want to hear one of them or two of them instead of all three, you can do that or you can hear none of them. Uh, I actually hear a lot in cricket that like professional players will like watch the TV, but turn the sound off. I just wanted to get the same thing in baseball where they just don't want to hear it. Well, that's the thing is that I, the, I like a lot of the sounds, even you know, if I'm not liking the commentary. Those, you know, last night I was watching a football game where it's like that, and this guy Rod Gilmore was the color guy, and he was just he was really irritating. So I wished I could just mute him and keep the rest of the sound. Oh, sometimes in Britain they have an option where you can put the fan commentary on. And I think you'd love that. Yeah. They just, well, they like actually commentary. have, with MLB TV, they have a thing, an option that's like, <coughs> I forgot what they call it, but it's something like stadium. So you just hear the stadium sound, basically like you were there, but you yeah. don't have So, uh, these, so, Jeff, I've got a, I've, I've got a, uh, oh, you, you heard the joke, so you'll probably be able to provide the flinch line. Uh, what's got a bottom at the top? Um, legs, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, I will... This is my, a summary of my review. So, there was that, a little bit there on that previous scan where it said Avon having two motives. What did you think of that? Well, sometimes he had more than two. Hmm. You know, over the course of the show, there was different stuff... And it seemed like um, early on in the show, he was more multifaceted. Yeah. And then, like, all the other characters got kind of weaker in the final season. You know, it just seemed like it followed too much of a, oh, we found out about this thing that we're trying to get. So on, it's on this planet. And, you know... Come down for this dangerous mission with me, so. <laughs> or I'll send you two of you off on another dangerous mission while we do this other thing. Yeah. And what a shock! Serverland's there, and, and it's all <laughs> elaborate plot to lure us to where this is. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, there we go. So that's my thought. I don't know how clear that is for you. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, what did you think of the humorous situation of Avon pretending to be uh, an android? Well, I didn't really find it that humorous because it's it was like, yeah, this fits. You know, he kind of said that, and I'm like, okay, you know, it, it's not too much of a stretch. But, um, and of course, without the visuals, yeah, you know, you don't see uh, his tendency to to uh, smile. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that you mentioned having to not do that when he was being the the android. Yeah, um, but, but I actually think that Paul Darrow was like, on his best behavior in this story. I thought he acted it well. Yeah, I mean, it would be real easy uh, to kind of look at something like this as being, you know, not an official part of this show or something that gets us kind of this side deal like you said you know get some money or whatever but you can tell that neither of these two actors view it that way because they're both you know giving it all with their performance like they would for any you know show they had done when they were doing it for television so that that's a definite plus is when you have actors that take it seriously and are doing you know are are doing it the as good as they can you know so yeah. that that's a definite a plus to anything, because you know if you get if you get the impression that the actors are basically just mailing it in, then it becomes something not worth listening to. I, I actually think this, this is like one of Darrow's best performances, if not his best, because um, uh, I I thought this is how Villa should be written, where they don't write him as an idiot. But they write him as like the SP things where like he's very good at thinking on his feet, even when it's stuff that he doesn't know about, and he's very good at bluffing. So. Yeah. Well, there's a line that Avon said about Phyllis charm. You know how he it, it irritated him sometimes, but it was useful. Mm. I think that um that might be a kind of a general thing that um, NTJs would say about SFPs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that that would be a common thing for why they could work together, but also somewhat rub each other the wrong way, depending on the circumstances. I mean, I think that can work when, I mean, Dario has publicly said that, has he, let me think. Yes, he has publicly said that um, uh, that he has a lot of ESFP friends, but that he wants to have more ESTP friends because they're good in business. <laughs> and, he, and, he, and I think he also publicly said that he can be intimidated by ESTPs. I mean, he actually used those terms or he called them something else? Uh, what do you mean? Well, I mean, uh, the Myers Briggs types. Yeah, he actually said ESTP and ESFP. Okay. okay, that's cool. So, did he say what his type was? What, Dario Nardi is INTJ as heck. Oh, no, I, I thought you said Darrow, like the actor. Oh, did I say Darrow? Oh, sorry, I, said, um, I must have slurred my words, Dario. Okay. I thought you were talking about, still talking about uh, Paul Darrow, so I was like, oh, I, that's cool. He knows about Fire's <laughs> Breaks. But... Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, I should have said Nardi. I shouldn't have just been like name dropping. Um, I have a tendency to do that, as folks might know. <laughs> it's all right. I just misheard you, I guess. Right, so. so funny. I really thought it was good for the showing a the, the Avon character, the connection to 14. I thought was good. And what did you think of that? And then also the first person perspective of Avon. Um, it was a little bit odd. And then it sort of felt like they were kind of trying to force a relationship in a way with the two of them, I guess. Um, so that was probably my least favorite thing. Oh, yeah. Really? That and just sort of the stuff about the scientists that wasn't really that interesting. But uh, 
I guess it's harder, you know, when it's the characters that aren't appearing in terms of you're not actually hearing their voices, you're just having them characterized by the narrator, so it's harder to Yes. You know, to make them as interesting. But uh I mean they they were described well, it's just uh, it still was very much um you know, they were only there to move along the action, so um but yeah, I I <laughs> in, in traditional Blake Seven style, uh, they set up this character that's interesting, uh, and try to you know create like this backstory or something about it, and then and then get rid of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, a, that was that felt a little familiar too. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, the, the other, they have an excuse that they can't change the established continuity. <laughs> well, right. Uh, Too much. But, you know, there's certain things they could still get away with within it, I, within it, I think. Yeah. I mean, at least in Weapon, the story you don't like, that they didn't kill off the, the clone, Blake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, within, there's, there's plenty of episodes of Blake 7 that are basically self-contained in terms of that mm. there's not anything particularly that happens that changes the the you know setup for the next episode so with there's plenty of opportunity to put stories in between episodes where something yeah you know it does change but then it changes back in a sense so yeah, yeah. they did that with doctor who because they right. they had um i think i haven't actually heard the sixth doctor audios yet but they but both the fifth and sixth Doctor, at least, uh, they have new companions that weren't in the TV show that appear, you know, that come in to come in during audio episodes and then leave during later ones. So, you know, they it fits still within the continuity of the TV show because it's just set in between TV episodes where that companion is just in between those. <laughs> so I know initially you weren't keen on Villa. But, and I know you, you thought the series deteriorated, but did you grow to like Villa more? Hmm. And or the actor? Grow to like. Well, I never, th I mean, I know a problem with the actor. I said, I think, I think at the first few episodes, I said he seemed the most scripted, but it wasn't even really a criticism of his acting as much as it was that it seemed like the show was set up that they needed to have sort of a comic relief character and he was set up to be that guy. So some of his early dialogue was just sort of like one liners to, to have those, that aspect, I think. So, you know, that, that was, it made him appear a little bit of a weaker character, I think, but I don't think it was I don't, the actor's fault really. Um, uh, as far as liking him more, I mean, not really, but but by I guess by the final season, uh, he had just since he'd been there the whole time, uh, he came off as more worthy of being there than some of the new characters, I guess. Yeah, you know, in the sense that it was like, uh, you know, why were they having Tarrant get the better of him, you know, and that seemed like it was kind of like. Uh, didn't I don't know what the right word is, but it just seemed like incongruent, I guess, with the rest of the show. That you know, yeah, he was portrayed as a coward, but at the same time, he did stand up for himself. You know, he may not have wanted to go into what he considered to be dangerous situations, but uh, he didn't just let everybody walk all over him. Yeah. So, so yeah, I think you know he, he had his ups and downs, like all of the characters, I guess that the ones that lasted through the show. I, I thought, uh, I thought it was very good in this story, Michael Keaton. Yeah, I, I did too. Very good. Right then, so Jeff, what do you give it out of ten? Oh. Five, six, five and a half, somewhere in there. Mm, that's quite high for you. <laughs> it was it was uh, reasonably enjoyable. Uh, I didn't fall asleep. 
and there wasn't any like you know moments where I was like really cringing and like oh this is awful or something like that so right, so let, let's yeah. have a look at your scores did you say five and a half something like that yeah somewhere in there yeah right, so that would that would put it already in like your top 16 <laughs> yeah <laughs> because you gave your 17th time squad got a five and gambit got five and a half and that was number 16 yeah well i mean that was like i said in in a lot of the tv episodes there was stuff that always made it disappointing to me there was something that ruined it and this one really didn't have that it didn't have anything that was super exciting either mm. either but it didn't have anything that was like oh you know this was terrible plot development or you know ridiculous concept or anything like that it was just sort of like you know okay this was reasonably enjoyable and then and then it was over yep. <laughs> so like i said I, my my thing with the format you know i realized with the tv format they had you know their time slot and whatever with i think with audio when you have maybe a little more freedom with that uh, that, you know, they could do slightly differently. And I would have uh, made it shorter. You know, you could, you could have the same length, but divide it into like two parts instead of just one long part, which I've said about Doctor Who stories too, because even though they do episodes, some of the Doctor Who audios, the individual episodes are too long. Right then. So you gave that one five and a half. Is that correct? <laughs> I guess it's not yeah. like it's some official thing or something. Uh, okay. so. <laughs> well, I have written it down on the official sheet. Of just... Well, <laughs> I mean, I don't remember when we did the audios before. The only one I remember, I guess, I guess there were two of them uh, that I think I gave a seven. So you know, but I don't remember about the other ones because right. the first one you played for me, and then I think the last one, yeah, the two best, and then the other ones in between were. We're not as good, and I found myself falling asleep more often. So. Yeah, um, we anyway. had uh, just to the, just to remind the audience what we had. We had uh, uh, we had these. Uh, one of them was called fractures. The one where you, you know where they were hearing voices. And there was a creature pretending to be, other yeah. men, you know, to let them turn on each other. Yeah, that's still my favorite one of the audio ones I've heard. Because that was, you know, that did have exciting stuff in it because it was very much, um, you know, they utilized the full cast in a, in a cool way in terms of having all of the uh, interactions between the characters and you know, setting up the suspense of like who, who exactly is, is doing what to who here. So that was well done. I think I bigged up drones, but you maybe didn't like it as much. I can't remember. Yeah, that I think was... the other, if I remember at the other one that I that was good that I thought was better was caged. I think it was called. Right, that would have been towards the end. Yeah, that was the last one with the president in. Right. That one also had some exciting moments. It was pretty well done. Yeah, that had a good actor, Hugh Fraser, playing the president. Uh, what, did, what did you think of Warship? The, that was the one set after Star One. And so between... I, mean, I don't remember if I gave it a grade, I, uh, but I don't remember being all that impressed with it. Mm. I think I probably started to doze off. Yeah. <laughs> Had a lot of. Right, here we go. So what have we got here? One. Yeah, that was weird. There's like the first. They call the first one one, and then the other one one point one. Right, <laughs> because yeah, they realised hey, we can do more of these things. Right, so uh, right, yes, I've got some things I can actually play to Jeff after this when we stop this hangout because we've got we actually got some CDs. Where they talk to the people. I don't know, maybe it might be just talk. Anyhow, folks. So, what did I give it? Uh, I think I will give it. 
Oh. I think I'll give it an eight. Yeah. There were bits that were slow, but yeah, the performances were, and it's a relief to have Paul Darrow back, back on form and not being Captain Kirky. So, <laughs> so it's uh, bye from me. Bye-bye.